In this video, we're going to look at indefinite integrals and antiderivatives. So here's the notation for something we've called the definite integral. It's a gadget that measures signed area. So here we have a function f on the interval from a to b. And in this case, the definite integral is going to yield the area above the horizontal axis minus the area below the horizontal axis. And what's a convenient way to calculate this number? Well, we've learned there's the so-called evaluation theorem, which is one face of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And that theorem says that if you have an antiderivative for the integrand function, then you can evaluate this antiderivative at the endpoints, and it'll yield the value of the definite integral. Now, there's this sort of spring-loaded notation, which helps you write f of b minus f of a all in one shot. You put in the function uh, symbol, and then you put on this bracket with the subscript and superscript the limits of integration, and that sort of indicates that you should substitute b and a and subtract the values you get. Now just for fun, let's get rid of all references to the interval from a to b in this picture, and just watch what you get if you just literally take away all references to the interval, you get a statement that looks like this. If f is an antiderivative of f, then this symbol equals the antiderivative. So we're going to use this as an inspiration for a definition. The indefinite integral. The indefinite integral of a function f, denoted by this symbol, is defined to be the family of antiderivatives of f. And notice that we mean family. So we know that when you find one antiderivative, you're guaranteed of at least finding an infinite number of other antiderivatives by adding any arbitrary constant to that function. So the idea behind an indefinite integral is to find the family, complete family, of antiderivatives of a function. So for example, the indefinite integral of x squared is What's the antiderivative of x squared? 1 third x cubed plus c. And this constant, the so-called constant of integration, is traditionally included to indicate the entire family of antiderivatives. Antiderivative of cosine x, the indefinite integral of cosine x, is sine x. Indefinite integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared is arctan. And here is a general quadratic polynomial, and it's indefinite integral or antiderivative is going to be this cubic polynomial. So indefinite integral is essentially a synonym for antiderivative. But let's explore the notion of indefinite integral a little bit further. So the claim is that the indefinite integral is a potential or incipient definite integral. So what do we mean by this? So Take a look, here's the indefinite integral. And so what we really mean by this is that capital F prime of x is going to give us little f of x, our original function that's in the integrand of our indefinite integral. And now we can imagine that there are some spaces available so that we could include, say, limits of integration. Now watch what happens when we look at this statement. We notice that the spring-loaded notation on the right side indicates that we should take this function and evaluate it at b and a and subtract. And of course, the constant of integration won't matter. It'll, it'll cancel. And we get f of b minus f of a, which we know by the evaluation theorem, or the fundamental theorem of calculus, is actually going to give us the value of the definite integral. So we get a true statement when we sort of fill in the missing limits of integration. So this should tell you why indefinite integral is a synonym for antiderivative because you can think of it as a definite integration that's just waiting to happen once you supply the missing information, i.e. the endpoints of the interval a, b, and once you've supplied that information, you've made the integral definite. There's no mystery now. You know exactly where you're finding the definite integral. Now we're going to end this video with a very finicky example. So we're going to find the indefinite integral of the reciprocal function 1 over x. So here's a plot of 1 over x. And we might think, well, we know that the derivative of ln of x, a natural log function, the derivative of ln is the reciprocal function. So we might think that this should be our answer. 
And if somehow we could see the correctometer, we'd see that somehow the needle is almost on empty here. We're, we're quite incorrect. So what's the problem? Well, if we plot ln of x, we notice that there is a domain calamity. The domain of the natural log function is just the positive real numbers, but the domain of 1 over x is all non-zero numbers. So we're missing a heck of a lot of domain, and that's a real problem. So you might remember, well, that's right, we need ln of absolute value of x, and that will fill in all the missing arguments on the left side. Take a look at our meter, and we see that we still are getting mediocre partial credit. So what's going on here? Well, of course, we forgot the constant of integration. You can always add an arbitrary constant, thereby moving the graph up and down, and that should give you the more general family of antiderivatives. So now we look to the meter again, and we have not quite achieved full credit. What possibly could be missing from our solution? Well, something very subtle is going on in this example. Because the domain of the function 1 over x does not include x equals 0, it turns out that you can add independent constants on each of the intervals from negative infinity to 0 and 0 to infinity. In other words, your most general antiderivative looks like this. That's the way you get the entire family of antiderivatives of the reciprocal function. So usually you're not required to give this thorough an answer for the question, what is the antiderivative of 1 over x? Often ln of absolute value of x plus c is accepted, but you should know that in reality, the most general antiderivative of the reciprocal function is in fact one obtained by assigning independent constants of integration to each of the intervals negative infinity to 0 and 0 to infinity. More generally, when the domain of a function consists of a number of disconnected subintervals, then an independent constant of integration may be assigned on each of those subintervals. That's the way you really get the most general antiderivative when your domain is rather complicated.